there, comrades. Welcome to this week's episode of Red Library Political Education Podcast for Today's Left. We have a brand new reading series coming your way, starting right now. And it's also a brand new Lost Horizons Network collaboration with your comrades here at Red Library and our most excellent pod rads from The Regrettable Century. If you thought our prior episodes were ambitious, well then watch out because this is by far the most ambitious thing that we've tackled yet. We are going to be doing an in-depth, long-term reading of The Enchantments of Mammon, How Capitalism Became the Religion of Modernity by Eugene McCarraher. This book is all about lost horizons, romantic Marxism, and very critical historical deep dives into the development of capitalism and its relationship to religion and ideology. Going back, oh, you know, just about 900 years, this book is a tome. It's roughly a thousand pages, and we are going to do our best to slog through it in roughly about six to seven episodes. It will include a rotating cast of characters from both Red Library and The Regrettable Century. And with each episode, you will have a different pod rad, a different comrade, what have you, will be leading each section as we go through. So you're going to get a lot of variety, but it's also just a realistic way that we can tackle this massive, massive work that is incredibly important and one of the best things that I've encountered that really exemplifies our approach our general philosophy as the Lost Horizons Network. This is a lengthy one, so we're going to jump right in. But as always, let's run through our housekeeping items each and every week here for Red Library. Remember, as we mentioned, we are part of the Lost Horizons podcasting network focused on developing an analysis, a particular framework around dialectical pessimism and lost futures as it relates to carving out a new vision of the future, and recapturing utopias. If you'd like to become a patron of Red Library, please go down in the show notes or just head over to Patreon and find us there. And for as little as $1 per month, that's roughly a quarter per episode, you can get access to all of our exclusive content, all of our exclusive patron-only episodes, get access to our Discord server. We just started a new reading group on Jody Dean's The Communist Horizon, and there is already lots of spicy analysis, ice-cold motherfucking takes, just coming at you from every which way. You can access our Red Library Cinema movie nights that are roughly happening every Tuesday, future roundtable discussions like the one we just did at the end of June, and all sorts of other good stuff. Remember to like the show on Facebook, follow us on Twitter. We're starting to build up our follower count over there, so head over there and help us build a Twitter army of dialectical pessimists. And last but not least, just keep sharing the show around. Okay, without further ado, here we go. Part one of Eugene McCarrier's The Enchantments of Mammon. And Chris from The Regrettable Century is leading this one. Enjoy. We'll see you back here afterward. Hey everybody, welcome to our joint collaboration where we will be discussing a book called The Enchantments of Mammon. The subtitle is How Capitalism Became the Religion of Modernity by Eugene McCarraher. This is a very large book you picked for us to read, Chris. It's only like a thousand pages, dude. (laughs) That's not that many. I will say whatever you first suggested that we maybe read this together for for our shows for like a Lost Horizons collaboration. I was like, oh, yeah, this sounds great. And then I saw the page number and just shat myself. And I'm like, but we're going to do it. Of course we're going to do it because that's kind of the thing that we do with real, real nerd boy hours on our shows. Hell yeah. This is real nerd hours. Yeah. Yeah. Honestly, anything less than 500 pages is just not worth doing. That's true. Yeah, for real. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That being said, um, this book is way easier to digest than the last book, which was about half the length. <laughs> Splendor, Misery, and Possibility. Yeah. Which, which uh, uh, yeah. I still think is one of the most challenging books I have read in recent memory. Um, I'm glad we did it, but yeah, that was, a, that was a bit of a slog. It was. I feel like I know a whole hell of a lot about Yugoslavia now. Though. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's actually a point of reference for me in a lot of political discussions ever since. Yeah, um, same. Because of how much it has it, to say about the, the idea of transition mm-hmm. yeah. and like what, what a transitional form of society might be based on what we've experienced. So the slogs are worth it. So it was this one. This, this will be a good slog once we're done with it. And I think today we're going to go over the first section of the book, part one of the book, which contains three chapters. And these are incredibly dense chapters. 
And I think that, you know, moving forward, we'll probably be able to go through more than one part at a time because I don't think that the future chapters are as dense as the first couple of this one. I was going to mention that I guess for, for each separate part, we'll probably have a rotating cast of characters for the reading series and maybe different people will, will lead different sections. So we're going to try to spread it around so we can uh, engage in a true communist practice for actually tackling this book. Do you know anything about Eugene McCarraher? I had never heard of him before. I was actually a little shocked considering how much this book is kind of in my wheelhouse. And, and I know in all of our wheelhouses, but I was curious how you all actually found this book in the first place. I just saw it mentioned on Twitter once mm -hmm. and I thought the name sounded interesting. And uh, I, did, I looked it up and I read about it. And Eugene McCarraher is a, uh, he's a professor at Villanova, a humanities professor. And he writes a lot for different, you know, left leaning newspapers and magazines and stuff like The Nation and Dissent. And if I'm not mistaken, this guy sounds like he's a Catholic, just based on the language that he uses. Mm -hmm. But if so, he's definitely a leftist Catholic. And in fact, I would be very surprised to find out he wasn't a Marxist because he references Marx throughout the entirety of the book mm -hmm. positively. And uh, he, does, he does bring up disagreements <clears throat> he has with Marx. So if anything, he seems as though he comes from like a sort of libertarian socialist perspective mm -hmm. and that he's also some sort of Christian. Uh, he's an, an incredibly good writer. I love his style and he's super easy to read. It's very captivating. So yeah, I'm really I, glad we got to do this. Yeah, me too. I was actually, I think whenever I first sat down to start working on the section we're doing today, I was a little uh, bit dreading it because I'm like, oh my God, I have like all like a hundred pages of probably incredibly dense writing to go through and, and very little time. And I was shocked how readable it is. I think it's a rare writer and thinker who can make such dense material so easy, you know, at least relatively easy to digest and work through without losing any of the content and the depth. So I, I mean, I was kind of shocked by it. Anyway, so let's get into it. Okay, so the, the thesis of the book, as stated in the intro, McCarraher says that in the course of releasing the making and exchange of goods from the traditional restraints of Roman Catholicism, capitalism expelled sacredness from material objects and social relationships. And McCarraher states that there was once a sense of the sacred that surrounded the extracting of resources, the crafting them into goods, and the exchange of them on the market. So every single aspect of the social relations and the economic relations of society were once imbued with a sense of the sacred. And he says that the invention of the commodity and the when things became commodities and that were exchanged for profit, the sort of aura of, of, the, of the sacred was removed from them. He says, essentially, the premise of this book is that Protestantism basically aided capitalism in desacralizing, like stripping away all of the, the sacred trappings of Roman Catholicism that animated the world, that animated every aspect of life. Protestantism aided in stripping those away. And he basically uses Max Weber's thesis in uh, the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism, that, the, that Protestantism just desacralized the world. It's demystified, stripped away the sacredness of the world. But he goes this one step further and says that he believes that not only did capitalism and Protestantism, along with Protestantism, strip away that sacredness, but it basically re-mystified the world, re-enchanted the world with a religion that he calls mammonism, coming from the uh, criticisms of capitalism by his earliest critics, mammonism, which is just the replacing of the sacred nature of the universe with, uh, you know, removing God, removing, you know, uh, the sacramental way that things were understood and replacing that with the market and the commodity. So I was actually curious, I mean, my diving into this book was kind of a, a bit of a revelation for me, essentially because I remember reading Weber's Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism, and it was really impactful on me. And, and it was one of those things that I think definitely changed a lot of my thinking. And I know that a lot of other people I've read, I'm thinking about people like Charles Taylor, his work, The Secular Age, you know, describing that there's this distinction of this turning point historically in capital and like Western Europe and, and the U.S.'s development from this like sacred viewing of the universe and the world to this completely mm -hmm. secular, completely like everything is stripped away. 
And I was actually curious for you two, I mean, prior to reading this book, how familiar were you, even not with Weber, but even with the idea that capitalism had like stripped away everything that was sacred. And that was like part of what's, what capitalism did was to, and, and technology and rationalization was to make everything secular. Well, I mean, I'm familiar with um, what Marx says about it and how Marx refers to the Protestant Reformation positively as having, by stripping the absolute power away from the Catholic Church, it desanctified the monarchy and allowed for liberal democracy to enter the stage of history. Mm -hmm. So basically, in I'm familiar with it from Marx and Engels and from Weber a little bit. I didn't, I never read the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism, right? I never read it, but uh, I read enough of people's references to it to basically get the gist of what it was about. Yeah. And I've always read Marxists sort of criticize it and say that it's not good for this or that reason. So, uh, you know, I never actually like really dug into it, but now I kind of want to after having read this. It's not that long yeah. either. I mean, I definitely think it's worth reading. So yeah, Jason, yeah. I'm, I'm curious, what, what was your background on, on the desacralization thesis to call it something really nerdy and academic? The way I was going to start off was by saying, I don't know what to call it, but <laughs> so we're going to call go. it the the desacralization thesis pretty familiar actually for one because i feel like it's it's popped up and it's a notion that that's thrown around a lot in a lot of different writing but also i think that uh, there's something intuitive about it yeah i think like, so too especially in the period in which i was <clears throat> the first developing my like ideas about about the world which is the late 90s and early 2000s which is the that's the height of the new atheism hyper rationalization movement where all the liberals denigrate the notion of belief in anything to the, and you know, and being, being raised religious, I always, it always sort of struck me as like, you're taking away something without replacing it. And there's something necessary about, mm -hmm. about what you get when you have a faith and you're raised in a community of faith. And whether it's like deeply ritualistic, like you're Catholic or, or Muslim, or it's much more individualized and interpreted like, like the way that the Protestant variant of Christianity is, or, the myriad of neo-paganisms, there's some necessity for enchantment. What I was never, for, it never had occurred to me before is the idea that our capitalist world is enchanted, but with black magic. Yeah. And that it was never disenchanted in the first place, but rather just that all of the functions of belief have been replaced with lesser variants. So right off the bat, the, the way that this book starts was, let's say, intriguing at the very least. The first that I, that I had encountered the idea of capitalism as religion was because of Walter Benjamin. Mm -hmm. And he writes, what, like, I don't know, a thousand words on it, and that's it. It's but a bunch of good words, though. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, but uh, basically, McCarraher <laughs> is saying essentially what Benjamin said, but in a thousand pages. What he refers to it as is a misenchantment. Hmm. Not a disenchantment, it was a misenchantment. A parody or perversion of our longing for a sacramental way of being in the world. So I definitely feel that, because... Ever since I lost my faith, I looked for the feeling that having faith gave me elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And I found that initially in the socialist organization that I was part of for 10 years. And leaving that organization was sort of like losing my faith again. Mm -hmm. not, not as devastating, though, because I still have my faith. It was basically just like leaving the church to look for a different one. I, I definitely agree that there is this just deep human need for some sort of what he refers to as sacramental understanding of life, mm -hmm. of everything, you know, just as a way of existing. I, I was actually curious to ask you two about this as well. Since you brought up Benjamin, and I know we've all explored this in different ways on our shows, I mean, I, I read this and I firmly ground this in the sort of like gothic slash romantic slash warm current of Marxism. And so to me, this is a, a really great example of a very modern work on exactly what that perspective yeah. leads to or or the way that it really fundamentally shifts a lot of i think really common held beliefs such as like the one that capitalism has completely desacralized the world and that everything is now just pure rational ego calculation chris really fast i just want to read a quote here where he's sort of describing the common thesis that the world is being desacralized by capitalism he says History's assassin of enchantment, capitalism, quote, drowns the most heavenly ecstasies of religious fervor in the icy water of egotistical calculation. So he's kind of referencing um, Marx there a little bit. But to me, I think just mm -hmm. as, a, as a powerful way to state that's the thesis he's going to push back on. I thought that was a really great encapsulation of it. 
I'll just go ahead and quote him here. He says, the gospel of mammonism is the meretricious ontology of capital in which everything receives its value and even its very existence through the empty animism of money. It proclaims that capital is the mana or pneuma or soul or elan vital of the world, replacing the older enlivening spirits with one that is more real, energetic, and productive. You know what we could do is just check out this quote, like the entire... <laughs> That wouldn't be a bad way to do it. That's true. It is a very quotable text. He spits fire the entire time. Which is astonishing um, considering how long the book is. But at least for part one, yeah. it's yeah, pure fire all the way. Yeah. Well, like so, uh, when he says, sorry, just because this is this won't fit anywhere else. <laughs> when, he talk, when he talks about business advice books being as comically uh, arcane as End Times Prophecy and Dan Brown novels. <laughs> <laughs> shots fired shots like, fired at the I was like holy shit yeah. that's great it's it's true it's true yeah um he, he goes into a little bit of detail talking about the new age hucksters that have sort of become the the prophets of capitalism in the past 40 years mm -hmm. and i think that we should probably get to a little bit of how protestantism helped to desacralize the world because right now we're just expecting everyone to just take our word for it that it happened so I just wanted to say that, <laughs> I mean, because it did. I, th I thought we were about to wrap up. <laughs> yeah, that was it. Yeah, book over. Okay, so essentially Protestantism sees the ritual and the, the ritual, is specifically the sacraments of Catholicism as being a superstitious holdover of paganism, right? They, a, a Christianized form of the earlier enchantment of the universe and uh, what McCarrhurst calls a cultic ensemble of rituals and relics in which matter and human relationships were believed capable of mediating the supernatural. So Protestantism, according to, to Weber, was a mistrust of those elements of religion, especially the sacraments that like Calvinists specifically, and Calvinists are the big bad guys in, uh, in the first part of this book. <laughs> either straight up John Calvin and the Calvinists in Switzerland, or I think the ones who come out to be the, who come out worse in his portrayal is going, are going to be the, uh, the Puritans, which end up being the founders of the United States, essentially just this uptight Puritanism mixed with a enshrined worship of accumulation. And that ends up being the spirit that drives British capitalism and the spirit that uh, exists in the founding of the United States. And it lingers like the residue of a disease which diminishes your capacity for life, <laughs> even into the present day. Yeah, absolutely. And I will, I will say too, I mean, for anyone that hasn't read Weber's book, I mean, to me, I think the very simple, um, succinct takeaway from it is that a lot of what the general experience or the sort of the drive for profit and accumulation, what was actually driving it was this desacralized sort of Calvinist idea that basically you know who the chosen are by the, the good works that they do. And so right. the, his idea was is that that no longer is operating in a, sa in a sacred religious framework as now is shifted into the market and the accumulation of profits. And so basically his idea was that the more that you accumulate and have success in business, uh, essentially that is kind of this, uh, this like metaphysical validation that you are one of the chosen. And so just as a really simple takeaway, I think that's, that's kind of what Weber was criticizing and why he yeah. saw the Protestant ethic as one of the things that was driving accumulation. Right. So like in Catholicism, you've got the sacrament of reconciliation, which you are forgiven of your sins. And if you continue to sin, then the priest will, you know, probably not give you reconciliation. But in, in Protestantism, it's, it's all between you and God. And the way that you know that you're one of the elect in Protestantism is if you, if you sin constantly, then you know you're not one of the elect. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you do not project the works that you know you should be doing, then you're not one of the elect. So Calvinism essentially allays the anxiety of wondering whether or not you're actually going to go to heaven that is relieved in Catholicism through the sacraments by initiating what is called the calling, which exhorts someone to tireless labor, right? Mm -hmm. You're always working to improve yourself, your surroundings, 
if you are a doctor, a lawyer, a businessman of some sort, or even a farmer, whatever it is, you show your dedication to God by doing your job really well. And if you do your job really well, that means you're going to accumulate. And that means you're you're successful. You're one of the elect. So it's a drive to accumulate mm-hmm. begins right there. Of course, Calvinism doesn't start out that way. Calvinism has, uh, you know, he mentions here in the book that there was regulation that was sort of held over from Catholicism on how much one could accumulate and what kind of charity needed to be given to the poor. But we'll soon see how that goes out the window. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's it. I mean, it it adapts to the world that it is born into, or rather that. It's co-constitutive with the rise of capitalism, and it adapts along with it. So it doesn't start fully fledged as a prosperity gospel. No. But it the trajectory is not difficult to imagine either. When you see the Puritans and you put them in a place where they can murder everybody and enslave people and accumulate a lot of wealth, they're going to do it. And then, of course, it naturally starts to, you know, it, it doesn't, unless you reject your faith entirely because of the way you're massacring people and accumulating wealth, the only other thing to do is to, de- is to decide yeah. Oh, it's because of my faith that I was able to do this. And then there's not much of a leap from there. <clears throat> so from the outset, though, Protestantism, specifically Calvinism, saw itself as a champion of reason and dispeller of superstition, right? And it wasn't superstition, wasn't like the belief in God or the belief in, you know, the spiritual nature of the world. It was just the belief in the extra biblical things that Catholicism did. Right. Well, like, you know, dispelling superstition is like uh, you think that you can uh, you can be in touch with the spirits of nature and find a cure for your illness. We probably should kill you because it's superstitious and obviously from the devil, uh-huh. so, which is not a superstition at all. The fact that you're being influenced by the devil, that's obvious and rational. <laughs> so really quick, there's a quote on page eight that I wanted to touch on because You know, it's interesting. I feel like that I probably come at the general topic of the sacred nature of the world or the desacralization process from a very different perspective, which is, you know, one that I grew up studying Zen Buddhism and and Hinduism Mm -hmm. and, you know, practicing those things, teaching those things in different ways. One of the things I really love is that on this is on page eight on the bottom. And he just talks about how whenever we typically assume that the world has been like disenchanted by capital in this way, and is now only this rational, scientific sort of worldview, absent of any sacred dimension, he says that basically any attempt to like re-enchant the world based on that premise, it's going to amount to little more than than a tenuous and self-defeating therapy of consolation. And I found this really interesting because I think there's elements of this that we see now, you know, even as someone who comes from, you know, the the tradition of like Buddhism or even like studying things like yogic philosophy and religious thought that even in a lot of those sorts of things, you know, you have to wonder how much of it is like this attempt, the way that those get sort of um, captured by capital and turned into these like new age ideologies and, and you know, techniques to basically be a more disciplined, uh, functional capitalist subject. I do wonder if a lot of times they are operating on the idea that, oh, the world has been disenchanted. And so we're going to turn to the East in this like hyper Orientalist way to try to re-enchant the world. I've seen that a lot. And I think it does really amount to a little more than a therapy of consolation and usually makes you just more amenable to capitalist exploitation. What is it that he calls it? I wrote this down. It's an abortive exercise in willful (laughs) self-delusion. Like a deliberate effort at spontaneity is uh, is that's his example. Mm. I just, again, it's just some of that fire that he spits. What does this sort of sacramental way of understanding the world look like? To he goes into a lot of detail in part one, chapter one. Part one is called "The Dearest Freshness of Deep Down Things." <laughs> I had to strike that off my list of uh, potential autobiography titles. <laughs> yep. Chris, for part one, we're basically going to be looking at Europe from 1600 to 1914. So you're about to cover 314 years of history. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's like uh, 100 minutes every, I mean, 100 years every 15 minutes. Yeah, that's fine. I'm sure not much happened anyway. <laughs> so let's just take the highlights. The medieval moral economy is what he's talking about here he says, was enveloped in a sacramental worldview. All the material of the world and social life would reflect and convey divine grace and power. Every social class, serf, lord, burgeoning bourgeoisie, merchant class, artisan class, even the pope, saw the world as sacramental and pervaded by the presence of God. 
which the highest example of that w- that sacramental idea would have been the Eucharist, which displayed God's blessing and beatitude. The ultimate gift of God and the way that Catholics understood the world is through the Eucharist, right? By taking in the, bl- the body and the blood of Christ, the sacrifice that Christ made in order to save the world from sin, right? The sacraments were used to sanction everything, every aspect of life. You would have in the, in the marketplaces, you would have uh, masses going on in the marketplaces of Florence so that the, uh, even the exchange uh, of commodities and, and of wealth and the accumulation of wealth still had an air of holiness to it. And the medieval idea of society was co- he referred to as communitas communitatum which is a community of communities. So families, manors, guilds, cities, parishes, everything, fraternal organizations, universities, were all, all fell within that interweaving of communities. And all those communities were governed by a web of laws and rules that were moral rules and legal codes, guild charters, and they all had spiritual meaning to them. So medieval canon lawyers and philosophers constructed an elaborate system of just prices and wages and regulation. Of course, there was those rules were often flouted, but there existed like a charter, like a set of rules and agreements that everyone at least pretended to live by, where the community took care of each other. The Lord, when the Lord took on a vassal, he swore to the vassal to give him protection and to provide him with an ability to make a living and then when that vassal took serfs under his command to exploit, he also had an obligation to his serfs, a sort of social contract that existed. And the way that medieval peasants saw the world was a world in which they were owed a living and they were owed protection. <laughs> You're about to start seeing crass, Jason. I was just going to say, of course they owe us a living. Of course they <laughs> fucking do. <laughs> So uh, the urban guilds of the 10th and 11th century and even their rural economy were imbued with the sacramental imagination that he's talking about. And the aim of the guilds was to sacralize the cohesion of the membership. And all the guild rules and charters were codified with that spirit of communion and mutual aid. They included support for orphans and the poor, and they endowed churches and hospitals, even universities. And the money that was accumulated was used for charity and the care of guild members and their families. And it wasn't just accumulated for accumulation's sake. Mm -hmm. And in fact, a Benedictine monk that he mentions here once called these guilds the left hand of the mystical body of Christ. Were you going to touch on the commons at this point or is is that? Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm getting to the commons. Okay. In the countryside, a similar model prevailed of the economy prevailed. The commons, as they were referred to in England, but the commons exist everywhere across Europe would be common grazing land and forests. And there was an idea of the assignment of power to the entirety of the community for determining property rights and the provision of subsistence and the organization of labor. So you have to think of a medieval village as a commune. You know, a medieval village, even though it was ruled over by a lord, still operated as a sort of autonomous commune where the village leaders and the village would collectively decide on who got land, how much land they were allowed to work. And if there, if there was a labor shortage, they would reallocate labor in order to be able to get the harvest in. It wouldn't just be each individual farmer would get his grain and that would be it. They would pool their grain and they would pay the Lord what the Lord was you know, owed in order for them to be able to live on this land. But all of those decisions were made communally. So Sounds in- positively Soviet. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> cue the the cue mirror, the, national the mirror, and the Anglo-Saxon commune were essentially similar in makeup. The village belonged to the people; they lived there collectively, and they had right of use, not individual ownership. So, I have to say really quickly here, considering the theme of our podcasting network and our shows is lost futures and lost horizons. You know, my understanding of the commons in the history of capital's development completely excluded the the sort of nature of not, I mean, I think it was seen as very much just about the land itself, just about the particular land, these common areas that were sectioned off and then were going to be basically, you know, captured and subsumed under capital and, and wage labor. 
But the idea that this was also about like where he says, and I think you mentioned this, Chris, like the provision of subsistence and the organization of labor. I mean, to me, even in reading like Marxist historians of capital, I'm th- thinking about Ellen Mason's Woods, The Origins of Capital, that element of it, that sort of density of what actually the commons meant. Again, I, I don't remember ever encountering that. So for me, it's it's kind of a really interesting kind of thing to read that even as far back as like the way that the commons were functioning, that that in that sort of truly romantic Marxist kind of way, there is something that was existing back there that was lost. Right. And I mean, the, the way that the, the medieval village worked too was every so often they would redivide up plots of land to make sure that everybody had enough to live off of. So if one family was accumulating too much land, they would go, okay, time to divide things up again. Or if one family had more children and one family had fewer children and they couldn't work all the land, they would redivide up the plots of land so that everybody had as much as they needed to live off of and a little bit more. And just in contrast to that, I think I mentioned to y'all that we're going to be doing episodes on Guatemala. But, you know, in Guatemala, like prior to the U.S. sort of like backing of the crew and the overthrow of our bends, agrarian reform and redistributing the land was the most contentious, revolutionary, um, dangerous thing to touch on in politics. And right before that happened, again, like this sort of like dichotomously opposed example, 2% of the population, uh, uh, they own 72% of all the land. So, you know, the idea that there would just be this like kind of communal way to just say oh shit it looks like things are getting you know unequal or there's like divisions and like differences well let's just like redistribute the land from that it's like literally like the united states has destroyed whole countries and regions for anyone even beginning to talk about that in like a fairly reform-based way i mean it's just astonishing to think about it yeah Uh, i think one of my favorite points that he makes here is that the commons essentially illustrates that there's this barely repressed desire for communism that like lurks in the political, what he says is the political unconscious of medieval Christendom. Mm -hmm. So like, I mean, the ideal state of living as is referred to in the Acts of the Apostles was communism. And anybody who knew the Bible knew that. So private property is essentially, you know, a rueful concession, quote unquote, to the fallen state of the world. You know, you've got imbued within medieval property relations as unequal and unjust as they actually are, there is at least an idea that whatever, like if your workshop, your land, whatever your means of subsistence are, is just that, a means of subsistence and a contribution to the common good, not for increasing wealth. Increasing wealth is not something that enters into the the equation here. Of course, people did it. The nobility Mm. did it as much as they possibly could. But just like in the in the United States, the, we have these grand sort of narratives about freedom and equality that don't actually exist. Sa- the same thing existed for the, the medieval social relations. Yeah, there's a quote on 27 I thought was good just to sort of bring this up. He says, to be sure, the medieval theological economy was no golden age of communion. This is, quote, the world we have lost was one that most pre-modern men and women would almost certainly not want to recover. The failure of medieval Christendom, Gregory writes, stemmed from the, quote, pervasive, long-standing, and undeniable failure of so many Christians to live by the church's own prescriptions and exhortations. So for me, I thought that was good, too. It's like we're not also trying to romanticize the past in a way that makes it, you know, nostalgic in the sense of like utopian and and completely divorced from what was actually happening. No, it's it's more like the romanticism that we've defended elsewhere and the nostalgia that we've defended elsewhere and the concept of lost horizons that we've defended. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is more like what we've lost is a vision of the future that they had in that part of the past. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. The the, the ideal which drove people then toward uh, a destiny that they hadn't arrived at yet is the thing we're trying to recover, not the actual conditions under which they labored and lived, which were abysmal. <laughs> Although yeah. still, I mean, you know, this is something of a digression, I guess, but like better than than an early capitalism anyways. Yeah, exactly. Better a medieval peasant than a landless peasant in the early mod- modern period that has been proletarianized. Mm-hmm. Yeah, or a, or a coltan miner in 21st century Africa. Yeah. I so mean, at least the peasants yeah. had more time off than we do now. I mean, that's something. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. So monasticism is in medieval Christian Christianity is seen as the ideal Christian life. And that part of the asceticism of monasticism is an ethic of full communism, right? All goods held in common, all work done for the collective. And, 
you know, it's even even St. Thomas Aquinas says that God's creation belongs to all, but in the fall of man, private property became a necessity. And if private property must exist, it must be oriented toward the common good. That ethic exists in Catholicism now, which is why you have so many, why something like the Catholic worker exists, but you don't have like the Baptist worker <laughs> or the, uh, there is black like liberation theology that exists yeah. Yeah, that yeah, has, yeah. has the same kind of ethos. But I would say it doesn't exist in like sort of main, mainline Protestantism, more Calvinist Protestantism with a uh, made primarily of people who aren't historically oppressed descendants of slaves right mm. right there isn't much of an attempt a conscious attempt to draw like a direct lineage from gerard winstanley to some modern version of a what does he call it sacramental communist materialism right um there, but yeah. in catholicism that definitely exists right even i think it's it surprises a lot of people of how many trad caths that exist on twitter are actually like communists or yeah. communitarians of some sort mm-hmm. um and it really vexes a lot of people that you've got people that like love the pope and the catholic church but that are also espousing communism yeah so you've never heard of uh stalin <laughs> <laughs> well I, I would say not stalin, altogether different I, I would say stalin like, cynically used the the orthodox church to to further nationalism but you know I, I'll, I just mean that, like, there's no great unbridgeable chasm between a collectivist ethic and uh, hero worship. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. That's yeah, all I, I mean to I say. Like, what you're saying. Yeah. You could be a communist and be for Stalin, and you can be a communist and be for the Pope, because functionally it's the same thing. <laughs> uh, I, I'm going to go get a glass of water really quick. <laughs> okay. This is dropping a hot take right there. Arguably, Pope Francis has killed far fewer communists than Stalin did. <laughs> <laughs> We had a hot take, and now we just had a nuclear-level hot take. The idea of communism held some power over the medieval imagination, and he mentions here Joachim of Fiore, who inspired a bunch of movements like the the Beguines and the Beggards and the Brethren of the Free free Spirit, all of whom were communist. And they were uh, heretical movements. They were all communist. They were all anti-clerical they thought that the church had too much wealth and that it should be taken and given to the poor. A base, an orthodox version of that same sort of spirit is St. Francis of Assisi, who uh, the current pope has actually took his name from. And then he goes into one of my favorite topics of history, which is the Jacquerie of in northern France in 1358 and the English Peasant Revolt of 1381, which were both triggered not by like demands for a free market or democracy or anything like that, but basically the violations of the medieval moral economy. And he states that the typical peasant felt permanent rage at the nobility who had not fulfilled their duty of protection, which tradition and mutual obligation demanded of them. So it was a violation of the social contract, essentially, that you know fueled this permanent rage. There were a number of traditional restrictions on wages and loans and accumulation. Usury was illegal, which is essentially, which is where you get the idea of the Jewish money lender from, because mm-hmm. Christians were not allowed to lend money with interest, but Jews could. So that one Catholic rule forever has enshrined the Jews in the Western bigots imagination as like a greedy money lender type, like the archetype of uh, Shylock mm-hmm. from Merchant of Venice is forever the, the Jew in the mind of the Western bigot. So around the end of the late medieval period and the beginning of what we think of as the Renaissance, the early modern period, the you, you get a lot of the, the Christian humanists begin to glorify the accumulation of riches. And the Catholic Church starts rolling back some of it, its restrictions on usury, and accumulation, and the sacramental economy starts waning. But the Reformation, which demolished what remained of that the, the sacramental economy structure, didn't it set out to do that. In fact, a lot of the a lot of the early Protestant reformers weren't enthusiasts enthusiasts of capital. They weren't like really into the idea of free markets or anything like that. They were angry at the church for being so venal and corrupt, and mm-hmm. you know worldly and accumulating wealth. And so like the, specifically the Mennonites and Thomas Munzer 
and the Moravian Hutterites all had some sort of idea of medieval communism. So the Reformation was initially a revolt against the corrupt nature of the church. And, you know, it didn't cause capitalism, but it basically allowed for the new theological economy that had been developing for the past few centuries to uh, to step out into the open. It helped clear away obstacles. Right. It re- by the rejecting the power of, of the sacraments and the magical ritual, what Max Weber called the sanctification of worldly activity or the concentration of a calling was allowed to take the place of the sacraments. So I guess for McCarrie here, he's basically saying that unlike Weber, who saw the Protestant ethic being kind of undergirding what led to capital's development, he's saying that, no, there was like a like a resonance or sort of a way that it did help support it by that demolishing of the theological economy. It just wasn't necessarily aiming to do that, and it wasn't sort of the core driving process. Right. Well, I mean, McCarrie here essentially is a good Marxist here. He shows the terrain changing which led to the ideological shift and the ideological shift then has a relationship with the changing terrain that speeds up the process you know like dialectically yeah (laughs) let me do my little dialectic fingers here obviously (laughs) so you know so protestantism wasn't at its outset or even now a purely rational belief system because talks about how you know, there was a, a thriving culture of popular religion and magic and superstition that was eschewed by official Protestantism, but that existed anyway. And then he he, t- he mentions a few of some of my favorite Protestants because they're the most interesting, like Sir Francis Bacon, who blended like this animism with this mechanical conception of nature that was part of mainstream Protestantism. And he was like really into Rosicrucianism and al- alchemy. And he believed that even like rocks and gems had spirits, that the entire entirety of nature was infused with spirits. And then there, he mentions the Cambridge Platonists who depicted a spiritus mundi, which took the life force from the anima mundi, where the spiritus mundi is spirit of the world, and the anima mundi would be the soul of the world and infuse the soul of the world into the corporea mundi, which is the body of the world. So I don't know what the point of any of that was for them, but that's what they believed <laughs> in. <laughs> they believed that like the world actually had a spirit, that inanimate objects had a spirit, and that there was a Protestant sacralization that is going on while the official desacralization is happening at the top. Protestant theologians condemned magical thinking, but like Bacon, Boyle, and Isaac Newton were like into hermeticism and stuff, mm-hmm. into magic. And Rosicrucianism and alchemy. So the the magical thinking never went away. It's just sort of shifts. I almost wonder if there's a way that it becomes kind of this ideological underbelly. And, you know, it's like these practices will, are still there. They're just operating not so much out in the open, or they're having to shift their like particular like social location. I'm not going to go down this tangent because we're you know we got a lot to do. But you know, I'm someone who studied like mystery school, esoteric, secret society type stuff a little bit, and. You know, one of the things that's really interesting is you see also how those sorts of groups and communities and orders like provided a place of camaraderie and network building or community building with other people of a similar class and usually like Mm -hmm. mostly men. And so, you know, there's like also like a material draw to that as well. And I think that it was a way that you could find a certain kind of the way that like class strata was also like basically being replicated and and propagated through time was also in the way that, you know, there was a kind of shared knowledge you were organizing around. I mean, the question is always like, how much did they really believe? what they were practicing or was it basically much more about class interests and the sort of like communal element of being together with these other people well you know that's essentially where freemasonry comes from yeah like Mm -hmm. yeah the 17th and 18th century england after the protestant reformation and the stripping away of all the ritual of catholicism you get the rituals that are left in these communities of stonemasons that somehow attract the intelligentsia and the bourgeoisie and they become a, a repository of alchemical and hermetic knowledge. That, mm-hmm. And they, they recreate that ritual that was taken away during the Reformation mm-hmm. and in a secret society type of uh, setup. I've heard it said that, that Freemasonry really just like appealed to or appeals to this deep need for ritual mm-hmm. and a belief that you're part of something monumentally spiritual, you know? Yeah. 
you know, the magic of the natural world died hard. Protestants were not as rational as they would have would have led everyone to believe. In fact, the witch crazes were a Protestant phenomenon. Most people think that it was, you know, Catholics that were doing the witch burning. No, that was Protestants. Mm. Yeah. yeah, most people think it was Catholics in the Middle Ages rather than Protestants in the early modern period. Right. And that's critical, that distinction, because it's yeah. a feature of the birth of the capitalist world. Right. Rather than of the pre-capitalist world, where no one gave a shit if you were a witch, as long as you were a Christian. The the amount of witch burnings that happened in the uh, pre-capitalist world were minimal. The heretics were the real problem. And even then, I mean, this is something that I've studied pretty extensively. The The idea that the Catholic Church was constantly just burning heretics is totally blown out of proportion, totally sensationalized. The, the One of the most famous inquisitors in France had done something like 900 trials of heretics and only executed something like 60 people. Hmm. No, because the Inquisition didn't actually want to execute anybody because it meant that they failed. Hmm. They wanted to convince people of the error of their ways and have them integrate back into church, into, into the church. Of course, they would probably torture them and punish them corporally, but they would be integrated back into the church. So anyway, so, Chris, this might be too much of a tangent to go down. I mean, is there a quick and uh, relatively short summary you can give on why you think it is so sensationalized and blown out of proportion whenever we think back to the Inquisition now? Um, I would say that it, it became part of Protestant propaganda, like mm. uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs. I don't know if you're familiar with that. I've heard but of it, I know it, yeah. that when I was a kid, like I think in fifth grade or something, we, we read from Fox's Book of Martyrs of the church killing Protestant mm. heretics. I think it behooved the the narrative of Anglo and American Protestantism to think of the Catholic Church as an oppressive organization, more so than it actually was, right? Yeah. And I think that at least in the latter half of the 20th century and in the first couple of years of this century, those themes have really been thoroughly woven into popular culture and sort of meshed with this notion of totalitarianism mm -hmm. as a concept right. that right. just sort of like an ahistorical concept that you can find it everywhere you look so that the scourge of totalitarianism is like and fighting that scourge is like a perpetual battle for the freedom loving people who have a personal relationship with god and will rise and fall on their merit in the marketplace so that there's like a flattening of history to uh, whether it's fully consciously protestant or not is insignificant. I think it's, it has everything to do with the way in which the Protestant version of Christianity meshes so well with the laissez-faire notion of how to live life uh, in the capitalist world. So they've constructed a narrative, kind of accidentally, that suggests that this is the that this is the struggle. This is really dumb, but like I encountered more than once from like libertarians in in college that this uh, this idea that the struggle against the Soviet Union was identical to the struggle against King George III because it was totalitarian statism, and that's ungodly. I was like, that's, oh, well. That is dumb. Yeah, it is dumb, that's, right? That's real yeah. dumb guy shit, yeah. <laughs> dum, 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 dum. Do you remember that dude, Clint? Oh, yeah. The wrongest guy. <laughs> wrongest guy. Poor the, Clint. The wrongest person who has ever well, walked I decided, the Well, I decided to not say his last name. He could be anybody. This is Texas, after all. Yeah. I, I know like um, 55 people named Clint. <laughs> <laughs> there was also the Spanish Inquisition, which was a whole separate beast. And that was essentially an arm of the Spanish state. And that generally is conflated with the Catholic Inquisition as a whole, mm -hmm. which it was not. The Spanish Inquisition dealt with the existence of what they thought were secret Muslims and secret Jews that were living in Spain after the Reconquista. Yeah. And yeah. it was as terrible as everybody thinks it was. Yeah, but the but the idea is that that was really more of a question about the like reconquering of Spain from the Moors and this political state relationship. Like the prior groups right. are actually like in control of the country. It was essentially colonizing what had become over several centuries Moorish land, like yeah. Muslim mm -hmm. land, right? Yeah. And uh, it was an attempt to ethnically cleanse that land for Spanish Christians. Yep. I was going to say, like, you know, it's funny, like, right after denigrating the uh, the the comparisons of the, the perpetually raising head of totalitarianism, the Spanish Inquisition actually does mirror Lebensraum uh, a lot in terms of, like, the role that it plays in, as the state 
policy of taking land and clearing it of its inhabitants and conforming it to an idealized form. Except for the, the distinction is that the the racism against the population wasn't scientific, it was religious. So like, in theory, you could convert. And as long as you can make everyone believe that you converted, then you were okay. The mysticism of capitalist rationality is actually way less rational. And that, <laughs> that, that's sort of, that proves that point. Okay, so I'm going to move on from this. He talks about what Christopher Hill is. Christopher Hill, the guy that wrote The, the World Turned Upside Down? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good book. Everyone should read that. That's about the diggers. Who, well, it's, it's about the English Civil War overall. It's about the English Civil War, right. But, but he, he, he actually gives attention to the diggers as more than just like an, a minor footnote. Right, and we'll actually touch on them. But he referred to a Puritan cultural revolution that was rooted in, quote, the indomitable and lucrative faith in the divine imperative of profit. So, oh shit, I don't know who I wrote this, took this quote down from, but it, the quote is, if duty is so profitable, might not making profit be a duty <laughs> to God, right? So Puritan cosmology was the source of its mercenary disposition. Okay, so the Puritan god was a celestial improver. And the way that Puritans saw themselves was, saw their duty was as to also be improvers. So as Richard Baxter said, if God shew you a way in which you may lawfully get more than in another way, and you refuse this and choose a less gainful way, you cross one of the ends of your calling and refuse to be God's steward. So the the sermon writers, the the authors, the intellectuals of Puritanism were imploring people to attempt to uh, to accumulate wealth as their duty to God. He mentions John Flavel, who says that improvement brings a worker close to God, and laboring with the earth could have more sacramental eff- efficacy than the Eucharist. So the skillful and industrious improvement, we can experience a fuller taste of Christ in heaven. I don't know. Ah, That's my problem. (laughs) There we go. It's haven't accumulated enough. Yeah. Yeah. And there's this whole culture of utopian capitalist literature, which upon reading it sounds like the dumbest and most lame shit I've ever heard. But he he mentions Gabriel Platts, who, I don't know if you know who John Winthrop, Mm -hmm. he's the, uh, the leader of the colony of Connecticut. And he was heavily influenced by Gabriel Platts, who called for Christians to abandon doctrinal disputation and concentrate on wealth, the real pith and substance of religion. So (laughs) reading about intellectual and theological justifications for Protestant prosperity theology just kind of made me ill. Like I hate it even more than I did before. (laughs) I imagine that is a strong statement for you to make. Right. And this is, we haven't even gotten to the worst of it yet. So the Platts, like he wrote these little novels about a capitalist kingdom of innovation and technology where the feudal Lord was replaced with the landlord and wage labor. And it championed enclosure and the dissolution of the commons. So I think one of the things that's very eerie to me reading through, especially this first part is the similarity of trends or how there are differences, historical context and differences. And yet there are also like so many things I read in here that just sound so eerily reminiscent of things I hear people say right now today. You know, not, oh, I know. not just on the right, but also on the left too. I mean, like recovering this history of like this sort of like communist urge or this sort of like nascent, like communist kind of perspective. I mean, I, there's stuff in here. I'm like, oh, I've said shit kind of like that, which is something I'm kind of trying to wrap my head around. It's like the continuity over time of certain Uh responses to these general conditions and historical trends. So I just want to touch on John Locke real quick because he's such a famous figure and uh, it would be a shame to not mention him. But Locke actually, on, on top of being one of the great thinkers of the Enlightenment, is actually sort of a theologian of this proto prosperity gospel. And he said that God had given earth to man and woman to make use of it to the best of their advantage. And that land that has no improvement is a waste. Mm -hmm. The creation of exchange value was all important. And he actually implied that the Indians who refused to improve their land had less right to it. Improvement, not labor, confers the right to property. And improvement was God's appointed business. That right there is just moral justification for manifest destiny, essentially. 
Yeah, and like foundational thinker and the whole development of the U.S. political structure of government and how we think about politics and its relation to land and everything else. Yeah, I don't, I don't think we've ever even mentioned Locke on Red Library, but, you know, I feel like if there's one thing to take from it, it's that idea that, well, unless you're actually, you know, tilling the land and developing it and making it productive, eh, you really don't have any right to it. Right, and undeveloped land is a waste. Mm -hmm. Like, nature is a waste. That is such a sharp contrast to the sacramental view that mm -hmm. that uh, that existed previously, where nature was like created by God, mm -hmm. and you can look at nature and know that God exists just by looking at it. And then he talks a little bit about John Bunyan and Pilgrim's Progress, which I had to but read as a kid, and that book is dumb, <laughs> but at least he was attempting to <laughs> criticize the gospel of wealth. But then he talks about Paradise Lost by John Milton, who is fucking baller and paradise lost is awesome king shit paradise lost hell yeah yeah paradise lost rules and uh it's an anti-calvinist masterpiece is what i wrote down <laughs> <laughs> which was rooted in uh john milton's sort of animist materialism which was an ontology that saw no distinction between spirit and matter and i wish kevin wasn't lame and was here because this is one of the things that he talks about all the time that's his uh his thing the uh, Cartesian separation of spirit and matter, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, Milton here is saying that that's bullshit, and he champions this sort of heterodox sacramentality, which inspires a vision of communism and a critique of, of accumulation. Like, in his view, Adam and Eve were having a happy communist life, performing no more toil than they needed just to live. And then after Lucifer enters the garden and tricks them, they have to become laborers. Yeah, God introduces the shock doctrine <laughs> into the garden. <laughs> Naomi Klein should have started with God initially yeah. in the shock doctrine. Milton suggests that the ethic of improvement is the spawn of mammon. And mammon is a being that reveres and desires creation more than he, it loves the creator. He's a demon of possessive individualism. While mm. other demons like Moloch and Belial rally demons in rebellion, Mammon advises strenuous, defiant self-reliance. And it says, quote, We can seek our own good for ourselves, live for ourselves, free and to none accountable, preferring a hard liberty to heaven's easy yoke. Murray like Rothbard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> say, that sounds like every hardcore libertarian, libertarian yeah. like, yeah, yeah. paleoconservative I've ever met. <laughs> Mammon preaches work ethic, labor, and endurance. He is the voice of capitalist enterprise. So in Paradise Lost, the, the capital of hell is called Pandemonium. And that is explicitly to be seen as the paradigm for later human despoilment <clears throat> of the earth. And he says that just like the devils of hell fractured the soil and the mountains for building, so would later humans do this, despoil the earth in order to extract profit this is the the one of the most baller quotes of all time he said though i may be sent to hell for it for writing this book such a god will never command my respect <laughs> <laughs> man that's awesome yeah oh yeah King well like shit. think about the idea that you could be a person who believes in an omnipotent loving creator god who bequeathed the whole of the of the natural world to his preferred creation which is you know man human beings but all of it's a fucking waste like it's this whole thing it's like it's not worth anything at all but you can have it and that actually that that means that you your your notion of god is that he made a mistake and that your role as a as a believer is to rectify god's mistake by undoing the natural world well it's mental gymnastics at the very least according to milton and his ilk it's a religion of idolatry and just arrogance. And well, it's one of the signs of the end times, right? All these false prophets. Yeah, exactly. We've been living so, through a lot, of, a long period of end times. Yeah, yeah. Dude, the end time. Well, I mean, uh, a day, you know, a thousand years is like a blink of an eye to the God, right? So maybe that end times prophecy is just. We're just waiting for him to open his eyes. Yeah, dude. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. Hell yeah. Um, real, real apocalyptic prophecy hours here. <laughs> this is the end of chapter one, and it just and briefly mentions that Milton gave voice to the ideas of all of these dissenters against uh, Puritan orthodoxy. And he said that, they, that their movements of craftsmen, displaced cottagers, 
and then an intellectual movement out of Oxford and Cambridge who looked to the tradition of the commons for inspiration. And among these these movements, he mentions the levelers, the familiists or the familists, the ranters, the diggers, who all blended ideas of magic and astrology and alchemy with this mechanical ph philosophy to create a Christian communism. And the most famous of all these is going to be someone who we've mentioned already is Gerard Winstansley, who occupied a hill that had previously been part of the commons, tore down all the fences and enclosures, planted vegetables, and called on everyone to join and help revive the ethos of the medieval countryside. And he declared that England would never be free until all enjoyed a free allowance to dig and labor the commons. Hmm. And well, of course, England is still not free. So England is still not free, yeah. right? So Oliver Cromwell and as Lord Protector of the Commonwealth crushed and dispersed all of these movements and just enshrined that Puritan mammonism as the official religion. I think we can maintain the inherent progress, the basic progressiveness of such a tragedy like that you can have you can have two ideas about it at the same time so uh, i guess sort of after all these movements are crushed macario says arguing the defeat of the good old cause when stanley had reflected melancholically on the failure of his attempt to re-enter eden quote knowledge why didst thou come to wound and not to cure and then basically Damn. talks about like, yeah like milton and, and why does knowledge keep doing that <laughs> sometimes it, it do be like that unfortunately Knowledge is always wounding our asses. All right, man. Uh, chapter two. <laughs> <laughs> on that note, <laughs> I thought about uh, trying to, to comment on the, the nature of self-knowledge and the horrible, tragic, melancholic dimension of it. And I just thought, nah. <laughs> I really identified with that last, uh, that last bit you really read. Knowledge be wounded. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm currently looking for that quote so that I can copy and paste it and post it. All right, now we're getting into real heretic hours here. Like <laughs> this is some idolatry that we're about to be talking about. Just the the grossest perversion of Christianity really gets going in chapter 2, God among commodities or Christian political economy. The early Puritan strictures against luxury fell away in the face of capital accumulation. Luxury becomes a good because, you know, the material basis of society is changing. So the ideology that rules it changes as well. Funny how that works. The incessant multiplication of material wants was lauded as the engine of progress. So we're going to talk about David Hume for a second, who said that the pleasures of luxury and profit promoted the increase of humanity and the expansion of moral concern and capacity of generosity. He literally believed that the richer you got, the more moral concern... And concern for humanity you had. What is it with fucking with, Scots around this time? Adam Smith, Hume, just, just garbage. Right. Speaking of which, you know, Smith talked about how what we would now call the Horatio Alger myth was a beneficent ruse of avarice. And he says, quote, enchanted with the distant idea of felicity, a poor boy charmed with the beauty of the luxuries abounding in the blue blood world of pleasure will work and cultivate his talents to fulfill his desire for riches only to discover that wealth and greatness are mere trinkets of frivolous utility. Yet it is well that nature imposes upon us this manner for it is this deception, which rouses and keeps continual motion of industry in mankind. So Adam Smith, you know, the, the philosopher of capitalism says, yeah, of course you're going to work all real hard to get the wealth that you think is owed to you so to become rich, but you're never going to get there. But what you're doing is driving capitalism forward, so thank you. I think it's important necessary to say myth. Too. Yeah, it's a necessary ideological illusion. Um, that also was from the Theory of Moral Sentiments, which is an earlier yeah. Smith work, which also important to read. That is part of that original Protestant work ethic that we've been mentioning so so far. But he also mentions that there is another Protestant ethic which uh, tries to relocate the enchantment that was formerly that it formerly imbued the external world in the self so in a disenchanted world the self remained the last bastion of enchantment so this sanctioned what he calls a christian sentimentalism where the individual sensibility served as the register of moral and religious faith and that sentimentalism celebrated the experience of delight in righteous conduct so 
that delight in righteous conduct was how, if you felt that delight, that's how you could tell that you were behaving righteously and were <laughs> one of the elect. So uh, just to connect the dots here, we don't know when it'll be out, but for anyone who listens to the Lost Horizons roundtables, the third one, we go real hard at the sense of righteousness and the delight that people take from it. So, Right. I, I thought of that when I was reading this. And that's one of the things I, I we've, we've said on the Regrettable Century from day one is that this leftist sort of policing and feeling that people get from eviscerating someone like a malefactor, someone they perceive as a malefactor, someone who, who strays from orthodoxy and who has a bad idea is just this fucking Puritan Protestant need to feel self-righteous, you know, to feel that righteous anger and to castigate someone who's a a castigated non-believer. And I I do think that that's something that hopefully our shows are aiming to try to correct that, not just through basically saying, fuck that, but also saying, here's a really deeply contextualized historical analysis of where that whole sense of self comes from and how it's actually tied into all these exact same structures of power that you think you're critiquing and rebelling against. Exactly. Yeah. Way to put it, because I was just going to say some bullshit. Also, i.e. some (laughs) bullshit. (laughs) Yeah. Let's see. Joseph Addison and Richard Steele are two thinkers who argued that consumption was not only pleasurable, but civilizing. (laughs) <laughs> I love how you had to read it in that voice. <laughs> it allows I mean, us to taste and see how gracious God is. Yeah, like no matter how you read it, that's how it sounds. That's yeah. how it sounds, right? <laughs> it compels so, you to read it that way. Blending virtue, reason, and comfort, Addison laid the groundwork for the political economy in which British evangelicals would defend the unfettered market. Sentimentalism and science married to create a morality that refashioned a Puritan work ethic to fit the rising class of merchants, factory owners, and managers. It becomes a new set of morality, which just happens to work out with the fact that these guys have a lot of money and can, and can conspicuously consume. And uh, he refers to Thomas Malthus as the economist of this new breed of Christian consumers. So... Not a big Malthus fan. I don't know about you guys. I don't know if I'm going out on a limb here and saying fuck Thomas Malthus, but hold on. You mean Thomas, Thomas Malthus, Malthus, friend of friend of the show, friend of Red Library, Thomas Malthus? <laughs> yeah, he was the progenitor of such modern left wing ideas as there are too many people, man. <laughs> <laughs> he believed that scarcity and suffering played positive roles, and that expulsion from Eden wasn't actually punishment, but an opportunity. <laughs> scarcity <laughs> and privation would compel us to moral and material improvement. Nowadays, they call that mindfulness. I put uh, (sighs) underneath, I said, this is the fucking cuck bootlicker theology. (laughs) (laughs) It's all about like your perception, man. You get tossed out of Eden, but it's an opportunity to like build an Eden. What I really love about how we're already doing this book is that, you know, McCary has this like really rich, beautiful description, historical analysis of all this. And then, you know, we're trying to translate it, right? To take it out of this like this context and make it graspable and it's really like yeah it's a fucking cut boot liquor theology that's really all we're talking about here just perfectly translated anyone can understand yeah. that we should make our own version of this book like a popular outline of it because you could really do it in about 10 pages <laughs> yeah okay so yeah. we're really going to get into how much malthus sucks right now i'm here um, for it malthus says and i'm going to quote him here We should facilitate, instead of the foolishly and vainly endeavoring to impede the operations of nature and producing mortality, i.e. the death of the poor. He told students in 1830 that God and nature decreed that the road to good shall be through evil, that no improvement shall take place in, in which the general advantage shall not be accompanied by partial suffering. And of course, that doesn't mean suffering for him or for the bourgeoisie, but for the poor. The principle of competition which God has set up in this wicked world as the silent arbiter of our fate is what McCarraher says conscribes the poor and dispossessed to the lifelong Calvary road. A lifelong Via Dolorosa, right? A lifelong whipping and scourging by mm-hmm. capital. And which uh, not I much think, has changed. I think that helps underscore how much disdain as a Christian he has for this theology. Now it would be wrong to not to not talk about the big beards here. Um, <laughs> Marx and Engels 
definitely acknowledge this endurance of the longing for the world of the old gods and the old sacramentalism of Catholicism. In fact, Marx's critique of capitalism is very, very much in line with this romantic understanding. He talks about capitalism in very romantic terms when criticizing it, of course. He also talks about it out of the other side of his mouth as being sort of the necessary engine that will drive proletarianization and socialization toward to a point <clears throat> where capitalism can become the groundwork for socialism. But he definitely talks about, he, and he, I'm going to quote him here, he says that the drive to accumulate drowns the most heavenly ecstasies in the icy waters of egotistical calculation, like you mentioned earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mark says that alienation and commodity fetishism are sort of generated by capitalism's own particular forms of religious deception and that those come out of the market exchange. So we talk about commodity fetishism all the time because I think it's super important part of understanding the world that we live in. And that is one of these instances of the ascribing of supernatural or m more than natural of undue powers to the commodity that exists. And it's part of this sort of like replacing of the hand of God with the indiv invisible hand of the market, you know, mm -hmm. just ascribing these quasi-religious functions to capitalism. Just a really quick quote. This is a, a little bit lower on 58. This is for all my uh, my new atheist friends out there, of which I, I have many or like two, maybe one, I don't know. But McGarrier says, the antidote to religion was not atheism, but revolution. Quote from Marx, after the earthly family is discovered to be the secret of the holy family, the former must then itself be destroyed in theory and in practice, unquote. <laughs> also mm. baller shit from Makara Hare and Marx. Once we realize that human beings are thoroughly and irreducibly matter, we could reclaim those powers and aspirations, ameliorate our, ameliorate our condition, and finally flourish in plenty, justice, and love. We would, in other words, realize the essence of Christianity, that is, the essence of humanity. A sort of going off of that right there. Mm -hmm. So that's also very beautifully written. Can we also touch on something really quick that I think is like a really, I don't know if I would say misreading, but incomplete reading of Marx whenever we talk about religion being the opium of the masses. Yeah, let's do that. So I, this is uh, on 59, but to me, I thought this was, this was a really great correction to that, that typical understanding of Marx. He says, yet if religion was the, quote, opium of the people, unquote, as he had written in an essay published earlier that year, it was also, quote, the soul of soulless conditions and illusory happiness, the halo for a veil of tears. Marx admonished the enlightened radicals of his day that it was not enough simply to hector the oppressed about the opiate illusions of religion, they must mobilize the wretched to reclaim the means of humanity and thus eradicate their alienation. This is Marx, quote, to call on them to give up their illusion about, the, the, about their condition is to call on them to give up a condition that requires illusions, unquote. Again, religion would be overcome through political struggle and material development, not the secularist homilies of the intelligentsia. That was one of my favorite yeah. short passages in the whole first part. Yeah, I mean, that's like, I was having this conversation with some friends uh, recently we were talking about religion or belief or faith in in the broadest way you can understand it and uh you know and somebody made the made a quip about the opium of the people and i was just thinking like but don't you guys like doing drugs <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Seems, opium is the opium of the people <laughs> like you you enjoy it for a reason right like think about what opium was in the 19th century opium was medicine that dulled pain right of course it was something a drug that people also used but primarily its main usage in like 19th century society was as a, something that you gave to someone who was like getting a tooth pulled or getting a gangrenous limb <laughs> amputated. Yeah. So it's, it's not just that it is, it dulls the senses and pacifies. It also is a necessary component to dealing with the pain that would otherwise be unbearable. Yeah. I fall asleep to a lot of stand-up comedy because a lot of it's not good enough to pay attention to. So, <laughs> but shots so fired some, at stand-up comedy. <laughs> so st some stand-up somewhere. I just have a vague v memory of this, but he said, uh, you know, I can't be friends with anybody whose life is so good that they don't have to drink. <laughs> and put that at home. <laughs> that's all we're really talking about here. Yeah. yeah. So... You know, Marx posits that, or McCarraher, 
mentions that Marx posits that the technological drive of capitalism would start to strip away the superstition of religion. I mean, that would eventually come to the full abolishment of religion in, you know, the communist state that exists after the collapse of capitalism. But that he, I'm going to quote McCarraher here because he just says everything so good. He says that as Marx was gradually realizing, even as he wrote the manifesto, the icy waters of capitalism did not drown the heavenly ecstasies. Rather, they pooled to form a new baptismal font for the alienation and religious projection. And he goes on to say that Marx's more visit, vivid awareness that religion had assumed a new guise in the allegedly secular world of capitalism uh, is illustrated by his idea of the fetishism of commodities and as well as the enchantments of industrial technology and factory organization. So he demonstrated that the philosophical and religious concerns of his youth persisted into his more quote-unquote economic period. McCarraher says that Marx's talent as a diagnostician outstripped his perspicacity as a prophet of disenchantment. Hmm. But it still kept it, though. It was still there. Like, people talk about two separate Marxes. Marx the Romantic and Marx the Economist. But it's it's there. It's still there. It just doesn't take the key focus. Marx's key contributions are his economic critiques of capitalism. But he always keeps that moral critique of capitalism. That doesn't ever go away. Yeah, again, the idea that there are two separate Marxes is a legacy of Louis Althusser's idea of the epistemological break between young Marx and old Marx. But again, he said that once, and then later on, basically, was just like, yeah, I don't know, I just said it. But yeah, I mean, that's not true. No, but it's, the, it's an enduring concept for a good reason, I think. Because of the way that the positivist thinking of like bourgeois science and uh, and like liberalism more generally has so thoroughly infected the left that the the ethereal and less tangible uh, aspects of Marx's thought are like uncomfortable for people because mm-hmm. it doesn't fit strictly into the like rationally ordered world that the bourgeoisie gave us that we're supposed to apparently pick up and carry forward like fully formed and then perfected. So there's this great desire for there to be a Marx which breaks with Marx's own thought or rather a thinking Marx as opposed to a feeling Marx. Like he grows up and moves on from all of the mysticism and the complicated shit like dialectics and alienation. And he just has a ruthless, rigid and cold hearted economic critique. And it's about efficiency and about uh, rationality and planning. That's the reason why Spengler called Marxism, you know, in his time, the communism of capitalism. (laughs) Because he was like, it completely strips all of the human element out of this very striving for a better world that is the essence of communism as a movement Mm -hmm. and and reduces it to, we could do a better job of building factories and of improving land and essentially doing the things which create value. The creation of value is is itself, you know, this, so the religious thinking that we've adopted, we just think that the bourgeoisie is not uh, as good at it and we need a reformation rather than an actual break. I will just say that whenever I encounter that, because it is, I think, a very persistent legacy of that efficient, like rationalist, like scientific based kind of Marxism. Part of me is always just like, have you read Capital Volume 1, even like the first couple of chapters? Because I don't understand how you could actually read Capital and come away from it with this idea that there is a clean break and that the the Marx, the, the rhetorical power of Marx precisely comes from him drawing on that sort of moral, like warm strain, very dynamic, like beautifully phrased way of like describing exactly what he thinks capital is, is sort of most destructive at it doing. I mean, this is a quick quote on 62, but he says, later in Capital, Marx portrayed the industrial apparatus has a quote, a mechanical monster whose body fills whole factories and whose demon power at first failed under the slow and measured motion of its giant's limbs at length breaks out into the fast and furious whirl of his countless working organs, unquote. This was not m- mere melodramatic rhetoric f- for it conveyed Marx's central contention about the nature of modern machinery and industry. That its, quote, demon power, unquote, was in the end the stolen and disfigured productive potency of the workers themselves. I don't understand how, if you've actually read Capital, how you could come away not getting the visceral Marx that's, like, operating not just on logic and reason, but also on like a deep sense of just moral and human egregiousness that capital is responsible for. So again, that's one of the reasons why I've always been so baffled by like that strain in Marxism. Cause I'm just like, have, have y'all read Marx? Oh no, you probably haven't. Sorry. Well, like, look, very few people have actually read capital, including no. the people who have read capital. <laughs> oof, no. oof, oof. <laughs> well, um, and very few people have read all three of them. I mean, I've, I've never read volume three. Yeah. But also, 
I think more importantly, ideology is a hell of a drug, you know, <laughs> like you could be thoroughly convinced of something and then you can read all about it and you can prove what you already thought. Yeah. You know, because it's very easy to like peruse something like capital and, you know, in the in all of the formulas of bolts of cloth and discussions of turnover time, you can miss the things which you aren't looking for, which is the, you know, the heart that actually drives the analysis itself. Like why even bother with this project of critiquing political economy? You can't really even understand it without things like the conditions of the working class in England. Or of the mm. Communist Manifesto, yeah, because it's all it's all part of the same project. But if you've decided what it is first and you go through and read it, it's kind of like the Bible. Yeah, you see you what know? you want to see. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. You can so, be you can be the Deacons for Defense, or you can be the Ku Klux Klan and read the same book. Speaking of Volume Three, um, this is Marx. He says it is an enchanted, perverted, topsy turvy world. This religion of everyday life, which I just thought was a again a great quote about how much Marx was very saliently critiquing this way right. that everyday life is actually this yeah this like weird perverted version of an enchanted world i wanted to read a, a quote also since we're doing quotes hell yeah quote time um to close out chapter two and that is mcgarraher says if the moral imagination of the proletariat was so thoroughly permeated by pecuniary enchantment and if the real subsumption of labor by capital was progressive and inexorable why would the oppressed ever desire the transcendence of alienation and servility with sufficient technical and political ingenuity, mass production, consumer culture, the welfare and regu regulatory policies of modern liberalism and of social democracy, the sacramental sorcery of the system's fetishism could retard, assimilate, or even extinguish the growth of revolutionary consciousness. And uh, I like to say in response to that, word. <laughs> Face. <laughs> I was just going to say bet. Bet McCary here. Yep. Now we're on chapter three. We're talking about the poetry of the past, romantic anti-capitalism, and the sacramental imagination. Holla. Uh, if you are a listener to, um, fuck, what's our podcast called? <laughs> Regrettable <laughs> Century. <laughs> Pod Save um, America. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Fucking the Ellen DeGeneres show. Um, you will be familiar with a bit of romantic anti-capitalism that exists within us and that we uh, talk about a lot. In an episode that we did with Donald from uh, Cosmonaut Magazine on Michael Lowy's book. Marxism Against the Tide of Modernity. No, no that, that was the name of our podcast. It oh, really? Romanticism, Romanticism Against the Tide of Moder Modernity was the name of the book that oh, we read okay, there on we go. that podcast. Right, right. I just read so the stupid I, book. I should have remembered that. Yeah, well, I, I did the episode and read the book, and I didn't remember either. <laughs> So it's real late here. So, We're getting deep into the. You night. also didn't remember the name of our podcast. So. <laughs> yeah, that's true. It's that's getting true. late. It's like almost eleven o'clock or something. Yeah, probably. we're putting in the work tonight. Yeah, we are, and this is after I spent like all day long like typing out all my notes and everything. <laughs> I've been in the zone for a very long time now, and I think I'm reaching the end of my limits. I'm gonna go ahead and start this off with a quote because that is what we do here. We're gonna let McCarraher speak for himself because he speaks a lot better than we do. Romanticism named the inexpungible feeling that the finite is not self-explanatory and self-justifying, that there is always an infinite beyond. Then natural supernaturalism was an heir to the Christian sacramental imagination. The visionary or rhapsodic quality of romanticism was a sacramental consciousness, a capacity to see or sense divinity in the minutiae of finitude. In a poetic rather than theological idiom, romantic metaphysics often envisaged, envisaged some reality that both transcended and pervaded the sensible world, some abiding mystery that left its alluring traces in the world of appearance. Which, to my mind, means that romanticism seems kind of baller, if that's all true. And then also that romanticism isn't this neatly defined historical period right. that has come and gone, but it's a, it's a tendency, it's a kind of particular response precisely to modern society, the Industrial Revolution, capitalism, all this stuff. So as long as those exist, this strain will also right. exist. And that's the yeah. thesis of that Michael Lowy book we were just talking about. Which is phenomenal. Like, well, yeah, yeah, that book it's is great. It's an incredible book. Yeah. But yeah, it's he, more it's more of a way of knowing mm -hmm. right. rather than like a well whatever. period of literature. Yeah. The romantics were in McCarrier's view of the impression that reason was torn away from the fabric of nature and humanity and that that sort of reason was the enemy, not reason itself. And that is something I think undergirds us our philosophy is amorphous as it is on the regrettable century. <laughs> is that we're not enemies of reason. We're enemies of this 
mechanistic sort of inhuman reason that refuses to recognize that all that is human needs to be embraced in order to be able to understand humanity and what humanity needs to move forward, right? Yeah, we're just saying that nothing human is alien to us. Yeah, exactly. Ooh, there you go. Yeah, good quote. And, uh, oh, I can't remember the, the, the great dictator quote about machine men, but we don't want to be those. I will say, too, I think that that is a really important notion because one of the legacies that we all are dealing with in some way, I think, is the legacy of Horkheimer and Adorno's Dialectic of Enlightenment, which is this idea that reason with a capital R writ large is the thing that has brought about the concentration camp and brought about Auschwitz. And I think it's important to recognize that, you know, later on, like Horkheimer distinguished between, you know, instrumental reason and this other kind of reason that didn't necessarily serve just to glorify the ends of capital or like efficiency or rationalization. So, you know, it's important to just distinguish even if you're coming from that perspective, like which kind of reason are we talking about? Yeah, we talked about that a little bit on our Walter Benjamin episode because yeah. mm -hmm. he essentially like lays the foundation for that idea that Horkheimer and Adorno pick up and go and run with mm -hmm. in the dialect of, of enlightenment. The imagination was the idea that the romantics came up with and the name that they gave to this sacramental consciousness, this new sacramental consciousness, one that was not necessarily Roman Catholic Orthodox, but sort of op just opposed to this, the Protestant ethic that we mentioned, both of the Protestant ethics that we mentioned, both the, the work ethic and this uh, personal religion ethic, the romantic sens sensibility of imagination was uh, the ability to, quote, see what was really there behind the illusion or obscurity produced by our will to dissect and dominate. So it was an attempt to see the enchantment of the world that was still there, regardless of the previous disenchantment that w had been attempted by capitalism or the industrial revolution or whatever, which, whichever part of modernity the romantic was taking aim at. So uh, McCarraher says that this, the spirit of Joachim of Fiore and of Milton and of Gerard Winstansley resurfaces in romantic anti-capitalism. These are the people that the romantic anti-capitalists take up as their figures of that, that they draw inspiration from. Now, I want to say um, really quick, sorry to jump in, Chris, but no, I it. think it's at this point, for me, it was actually a really kind of powerful thing to re-encounter William Blake in this book of all things, because right? I used yeah, to read yeah. William Blake all the time, but it's been years. And so I just, I'm going to read this really quick passage because it, it sort of like reminded me maybe like even very early on, I think that's what I was attracted to in Blake. He says in one of his earliest poems called Mammon, Blake recounted how one morning while praying for riches, he realized that he had prostrated himself before the demon deity of money. This is Blake, quote, I took it to be the throne of God. Unquote. Blake identified Mammon as the sponsor and architect of industrial capitalism, the proprietor of those, quote, dark satanic mills, unquote, that augured death and eternal damnation. So for me, it just reminded me, oh, yeah, like maybe even back when I was reading Blake and wasn't really thinking about, you know, Marxism and capitalism so much, there was still that that force of his writing, I remember, was just so palpable. And it's, I don't know, it's amazing to rediscover him here. Interesting to me, too, is like I had a come to Jesus moment with my Marxism where I realized I needed that romantic Marxism in order to continue being a Marxist because yeah. I had sort of lost enthusiasm for the Promethean in Marxism and that I didn't see a world in which Prometheanism alone could cure the ills of society. And having been trained in the stupid mechanistic version of Marxism that I was trained in, uh, I didn't realize that that existed there, you know, coming across r Marxist romanticism has, has been a big, you know, shot in the arm that I really needed to help continue for me to continue develop, uh, to develop, to develop as a Marxist, uh, to help sort of like undergird what it was that I always believed and to restore my faith in the emancipatory project of the proletariat, right? But I wasn't looking for a romantic, a romantic streak in Marxism and that, that warm stream of Marxism, it, but I found it. Mm -hmm. And I think it goes back to deep to this longing for the religious that exists within me and longing for enchantment and spirituality that exists within me that never went away, even when I was a fucking annoying atheist. <clears throat> And, uh, you know, I mean, the, the first books that I ever read as a child were the Bible. And then 
the romantic literature. Like when I was a little kid, my mom uh, would buy us like Treasure Island and Ivanhoe and The Black Arrow and, you know, those books. Those were the ones that we were allowed to read as a kid. So I remember being like a little kid, like 10 years old, reading all of this romantic literature. And that was all of my favorite stuff. And all of that stuff is just romanticism of a period that didn't exist. It was an idealized version of a period that like had never really existed. Mm -hmm. And to me, that is a powerful mechanism for understanding the world and constructing in my mind the utopian vision, the utopian horizon that I needed to move towards. Foundational to my education, thinker, in whichever capacity I am, was (laughs) romanticism. Which is interesting that I, you know, I eschewed the church. I moved away from all of that fucking reactionary, backward looking bullshit, went through this like cold stream, scientific Marxism, and then emerged on the other side, kind of like neck deep in that religion and romanticism again. Yeah. I mean, I'll I'll say quickly for me, I think when I look back of why that particular strain has been the thing that I came to, I think it's because prior to ever thinking about politics and getting into all the you know, Marxist sorts of historical, anyway, basically just Marxism writ large, I was a musician for 15, 20 years. And so I think that really shaped my way of thinking and interacting with the world through this kind of aesthetic, you know, sort of romantic lens in a way that I I think it was really surprising to me to come out the other side and say like, oh, yeah, like, even though I don't play music anymore, and I'm much more interested in reading and writing shit like this, that still shaped, you know, my basic phenomenological way of existing in the world. And so, I, yeah. you know, it's been a weird way. It came back in a capacity I didn't expect. Yeah, I think that it was always there. And maybe it was even something that I was trying to not be conscious of. But then it would always reemerge because I would get so much out of reading the speeches of Eugene Debs. And I would talk about this particular socialist with other with other comrades. And I would, often it would be like, yeah, Debs is, you know, like a great figure or whatever but like it's marxism it wasn't very good you know he's really very romantic lots of biblical allusions and references to like a romanticized version of american history you know like the revolution the reconstruction stuff like that these were all supposed to be jabs or, or or rather like um checks on the negative boxes on Debs as a figure in socialism, that it never it never diminished him in, in my eyes because to me it was like this is what speaks to me the most is this way of approaching the world which is quasi religious and from the heart you know this this the depth of feeling in the in the socialism of Eugene Debs uh, is what speaks to me the most and it, interestingly enough that's also what speaks to the American sensibility the most at least thus far in our history that was a uh, Mm-hmm. That was one of the high points. And I think that there's a reason why he spoke that way is because he spoke the language of the people he was trying to organize. Yeah. I don't I don't know how well we'll ever do if our argument is the same as like a, a magazine that you might find inside of a in the back of the seat of an airplane about like, you know, interviews with tech moguls about the future, but also it's equal. Okay, let's blaze through the rest of this. Let's do it. Just to wrap up William Blake, I thought it was super cool that he... Okay, I'm just going to read here what he said about this capitalist reason, this uh, religion of mammon. He said that he finds the spirit of evil, of evil in things heavenly and traced the origins of the desecration to the human capacity for idolatry. Man must and will have some religion, Blake warned. If he has not religion of Jesus, meaning not the official Christianity of the churches, but the undogmatic everlasting gospel of love and creative exuberance, then he will have the religion of Satan. And that's right before he read that you, that uh, Mammon poem. Mm-hmm. So he refers to capitalism as the religion of Satan. It is, an, I, it is <laughs> idolatry. And that's so baller to me. <laughs> I can't wait to say that to someone just the next time I talk to like a, like a hardcore, like evangelical Christian who is also like just hyper capitalist. I'm just going to be like, it's the religion of the devil. Capitalism is the religion of Satan. William Blake. The title of the book, Enchantments of Mammon, right? We see mammon as a theme here that all of the romantics think of capitalism as mammonism and think of the reverence for the market as the reverence for a false god. And they're right. It is. Um, <laughs> no arguments here. <laughs> yeah. So I want to, I just wanted to mention 
one of the 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 heroes of this era, which is shit. What's his name? What's his first name? Ruskin. Yeah, John what was Ruskin. Ruskin's first name. John. John Ruskin. Okay, yeah, I didn't. I put didn't put his first name down, so I forgot it. <laughs> Clint so, Ruskin. <laughs> good old Ruskin is a, a figure here that I didn't I didn't know anything about until I read the Michael Lowy book, but that is he's mentioned in great detail here by uh, McCarraher. McCarraher says that the restoration of nature's health depended not on the application of remedial technologies, but on the cultivation of hope, reverence, and love. Those are quote unquote, hope, reverence, and love by Ruskin. And that his sacramental ontology was the foundation of an equally sacramental humanism and says that the function of a human being is the full comprehension and contemplation of the beautiful as the gift of God and the use and function of a person to be the witness of the glory of God and to advance that glory by reasonable obedience and resultant happiness. So the soul of man is the mirror of the mind of God, a mirror dark, distorted, and broken, but he lamented, a a mirror dark, distorted, and broken, he lamented, but reflective nonetheless of divinity. So he sees in nature God and the despoiling of nature as an affront to God and that true religion and a, a way to be truly happy is to live in contemplation of the beauty that is a gift of God. So to Ruskin, despoiling nature is like a cardinal sin. It's going mm-hmm. to be a mortal sin. Well, actually, it actually is a mortal sin in the Catholic Church now. The despoiling of nature, uh, ecological destruction is a mortal sin. Now. Really? Huh. Yeah. Yeah. Coming to that conclusion is what's known as uh, having a Kaczynski moment. <laughs> <laughs> having a big Teddy K moment. For Marx and Weber, capitalism was the dynamo of secular modernity. For Ruskin, it embodied a metamorphosis of the sacred and a perverse enchantment of the world. So Ruskin agrees with McCarraher in th- seeing capitalism as that perverse enchantment, that idolatry that Blake talked about. I mean, I think just to reconnect this to the original thesis of the book we were talking about, you know, again, it isn't a question of, is the world sacred or has it been, is it enchanted or is it not enchanted? It's the way that it is now enchanted, but in this perverse way. And that's a fundamental distinction. Um, And I thought this was where Ruskin describes the day of the typical business person as a regimen of spiritual discipline. Do you guys remember that? Where he Uh, says, yeah, the worship of mammon proceeds with a tender reverence and exact propriety reminiscent of Johnson's Volpone. I don't know what that is. The merchant rises to his mammon matins with the self-denial of an anchorite and asks forgiveness for the distractions that may keep him from his mammon vespers. Later, (laughs) Ruskin maintained that far from a secular denial of the supernatural, capitalism had its own ensemble of gods, sacraments, and spiritual devotions. I just like like the idea of mammon vespers and mammon matins. We're going to sell mammon vespers in our Etsy store for Lost Horizons once we get it up. <laughs> vespers <laughs> is the hour of the day that you say your prayers. <laughs> Uh, you know, every time I hear Vespers, you know what I think about? It's actually from Final Fantasy III. They were like the like very powerful like spirits that you summon to like do battle. So that's what I think of whenever I think Vespers. Oh, yeah. So in, in Catholicism, it's just the evening prayers. Yeah. Well, I think Final Fantasy, you think Catholicism. That's, that's maybe where our paths diverge, Chris. <laughs> yeah. It's because you're a weeb. <laughs> I am a fucking weeb. I, I won't <laughs> deny it. I'm a reformed weeb, okay? <laughs> You're you're a converso weeb, a secret unreformed weeb. Yeah, exactly. Crypto weeb. Yeah. Man, you know what's crazy? The last time I played Final <laughs> Fantasy, the last Final Fantasy that I played, rather, was Final Fantasy three on Super Nintendo. Mm, it's a great game. That game was awesome, but yeah. I've not, I haven't I yeah. played a single one since then. You got to play all those other Final Fantasies. Okay. So they have weird swords in the new ones. They do have weird They're swords. They're just stupid big swords. I can't. <laughs> the artwork makes me unable to play the game. I feel like we're actually sliding from, you know, revolutionary romanticism into conservative reactionary romanticism right now, and I won't stand for it. <laughs> if you don't play the new Final Fantasies, then you're a reactionary. Uh, I got to say that my big criticism of the new Final Fantasy games are. The really annoying music that accompanies chocobos. <laughs> it was pretty horrible. I can vouch for it that. It was terrible. I, yeah. My 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 wife plays that game all the time, or used to. <laughs> 
Ruskin sees the growth of capitalism and its dynamism as a metastasizing cancer. And he called conventional economics a pseudoscience and that capitalism was a, the political economy of death. <laughs> so, <laughs> damn. Ruskin rules, dude. I, I really like Ruskin. I think he's great. Ruskin, like Marx, he, uh, he had an idea of communist morality. Um, but it differed from Marx's a little bit because he disagreed with Marx on the idea of property, which I thought was interesting. McCarriher says that they would have quarreled over the abilities and needs that were to be cultivated and fulfilled. Because Marx, you know, for Marx, it was from each according to his abilities to each according to his needs. And that the future form of common ownership was inextric- inextricably bound to the course of capitalist development. But for Ruskin, that meant the the communist principle of morality would bear the marks of its Promethean ancestor, capitalism. It's It would keep its technocratic politics, its equation of abundance with industrial production, and the its defiant insensitivity to natural limits. We can see that in some versions of Marxism that people espouse today. And Ruskin is right to reject the idea of accumulation and production for the sake of production that exists in some people's ideas of Marxism. I will say really quickly here, and I know I mentioned this to, to both of you, I'm currently reading Kohei Saito's Karl Marx's Eco-Socialism, which I, I do think for me is actually a pretty good corrective to a common reading of Marx, which is that, yeah, he had like no no regard for natural limits, that he was this like hyper Promethean. Yeah. You know, and I, I, th- I will say the more I'm reading about like eco-socialist sorts of debates within Marxism, I do think that that might be a little bit of a simplified reading and that especially a lot of, I think, newly translated uh, Marxist texts seem to show that actually he changes his thinking on that quite right. heavily. Um, yeah. But, you know, I mean, for what that's worth, I mean, yeah, but some strains of Marxism, I think, do absolutely still uphold that kind of earlier approach that Marx took. In the tradition of Ruskin is William Morris, who is just as cool as Ruskin and I've got just as many notes about Morris as well. Is there anything about Morris that you guys wanted to talk about? Uh, if not, I just got a little thing that I would read about him to summarize kind of what he was into. It's probably the best approach. That's the best thing to do is probably just do that. Morris thought that necessity and freedom, labor and beauty should be bound up together. And the craftsperson embodied this union. Gothic architecture proved that a materially less abundant civilization could create beautiful and ennobling objects. Why then suppose that the beauty and goodness had to wait on the achievements of industrial plentitude, a bounty that was, in any case, so shabby and soul-destroying? William Morris thought that it was possible to move toward a communist society, skipping over the destructive phase of capitalist accumulation. And uh, that's where he would, you know, differ greatly from Marx. And that's going to be a common theme with a lot of these romantic anti-capitalists, uh, including the arts and crafts movement, which mm-hmm. sounds real dumb and lame, but it's actually kind of cool. <laughs> it's similar to the home ec movement. <laughs> yeah, the arts and crafts movement was a, an anti-capitalist movement of like small producers, essentially, that were really against the shoddy nature of mass-produced products and thought that they could band together and illustrate the the beauty of the artisan produced wares that they that they produced in order to illustrate the necessity to get rid of capitalism and move to something else. Of course, that's never going to be it was never able to take hold because it didn't have a mass base. It didn't have a base in a class that would 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 have been able to carry it to any kind of significant movement because it was essentially a movement of a dying class, which would have been the artisan class in Industrial Revolution England. I thought he also had a good connection here to the way that anarchists were sort of also struggling for this, like, what is progress going to be defined as, where right. he basically says that anarchists were not simply or merely, quote unquote, backward looking. Rather, they regarded the new industrial civilization through the lens of an artisanal sensibility. The often um, internecine struggle between Marxists and anarchists was a fight over the meaning and content of progress, not a duel between progress and its opponents. So, you know, I mean, maybe that's his libertarian socialist streak, but he has a pretty, I think, generous reading of anarchism and sort of the, the relationship between 
Marxism right. and anarchism in this period. Yeah, he he compares Kropotkin to Ruskin mm-hmm. here, and uh, when he he notes mutual aid in in mutual aid, a lot of the instances that Kropotkin draws from are from medieval uh, communes. And well, he, I was going to say, there's something very like Narodnik like about that way of thinking of the the desire to skip to divert around a period of capitalist development. Yeah, I mean, and that's essentially the the thesis of Silvia Federici's Caliban and the Witch is that there there existed a utopian horizon in the medieval peasant movements that could have skipped over the destructive period of capitalism to form some uh, type of peasant based socialism. I think there's another interesting example here in Marx himself that I first encountered in a book by Kevin B. Anderson called Marx at the Margins, which is sort of like a re... Yeah. Have you read that book, Jason? Uh, I haven't read it cover to cover. I've read like bits out of it for, for various reasons. Because you wanted to defend all white men who like Marx? <laughs> <laughs> Yep, basically. Yeah, that's why I read it. Um, but I do think there was something really interesting there about how, you know, Marx is typically branded as being like an Orientalist and sort of racist because of his view of capitalism was by necessity had to go into a place like India and basically destroy everything to then push everyone through this capitalist period of development. And that was a positive thing, you know, and it's not often mentioned that later on, he actually changed his view quite significantly and actually thought that like communal sort of lifestyles in India actually presented an alternative route to communism and socialism that did not have to go through capitalism. And so to me, it's like, that's in Marx himself. If you know, you read him thoroughly. Well, that's also uh, in the, what is it? The 1880, it's the Russian edition of the communist manifesto mm -hmm. in the the, introduction. by Engels. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. It's the he same thing. The, yeah. He talks about the mirror, mm-hmm. the Russian peasant commune as being a possible basis for the same sort of thing. Yeah. And actually that's mentioned a lot in the, the Michael Lowy book that, that we read. It talks about the Rosa Luxemburg disagreeing with uh, much of the, the rest of the Marxist community that saw the, that saw capitalism as symbolizing in the, uh, in South America and in India, Mm -hmm. and she saw it as purely destructive there. But that's who we end with is the anarchists here. He draws out, like you said, that competing vision of the future, not one of, uh, you know, the the anarchists aren't trying to hold on to something from the past, rather they were looking to the past in order to think, to construct uh, a vision of the future, which something that we're big proponents of doing. Yeah. And then he talks about the the anarchists had their own sense of enchantment that was of re-enchantment and that the anarchists were much like the English romantic anti-capitalists, uh, very spiritual. And he mentions Kropotkin and Kandinsky, who was uh, Vladislav Kandinsky, I think is his name. He said uh, Kandinsky's anarcho-enchantment had a political complement uh, in the work of the German libertarian socialist Gustav Landauer, who, as it turns out, and I learned this recently, was a big influence on Walter Benjamin. Mm-hmm. So Landauer was a, a hero to, according to McCarraher, to many German Jewish radicals, including Martin Buber. And he broke with Marxist orthodoxy in the Social Democratic Party as propounded by Karl Kautsky and Babel and August Babel. He was a big critic of second international Marxism. Really quick, I um, know that listeners won't be able to, to appreciate this, but we're doing a video call right now and this painting that's right on my shoulder, this is actually Kandinsky. Oh, so, really? Yeah, very fitting for this yeah. uh, this Oh, discussion yeah, yeah. Here. That's pretty cool. Vasily Kandinsky. What did I say it was? I think he said Vladislav. Vasily Kandinsky. Uh, we'll fix that uh, in post. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so Landauer contended that there is no science of the future and that human life is too various and volatile to be reduced to immutable, immutable laws. So he broke hard with the cold stream Marxist like Kautsky uh, uh, there. But I believe that he stayed a vibrant part of the Marxist movement and actually participated in the Bavarian Soviet. Oh, really? Huh. Mm. And Landauer proclaimed that we are poets, not pedants armed with fraudulent science, 
and socialism is a struggle for beauty, greatness, greatness, and abundance. Hell that's yeah. All I, that's Sign all me I up. got. Yeah. Landauer sounds pretty cool. I like him. And that is to say that anyone who's listening to us, like, we're not anti Cold Stream. We just kind of want to reintegrate the other stream of Marxism that is largely ignored because it is an important part, I think, of understanding what it is that we need to be able to harness to move people to act in their own interests towards liberation. Because I think that that's a theme of our show is that if we do not utilize everything that moves us, there are people who will. And the right is very good at moving people with emotion, with talks of religion and mysticism. And uh, if we don't understand uh, those very human impulses, then we're going to lose out to the right again, the way we always fucking do. I'll say this too. I know that you know, one of the things that you all have talked about quite a bit with Varn is the necessity of going back to the beginning and almost rethinking everything. Yes. And I will tell you, I think that for me more and more, what I'm, I take that to mean, or at least how I'm wanting to try to do that, or at least offer something is to say that if reuniting the streams is part of what has to happen, to me, that is going back to the beginning, because if we're going to call ourselves Marxist in any sort of way, you know, like I was alluding to earlier, I read Marx and that's that's what I love about Marx, because I'm like, oh, here's what what you can have or here's the potential of having both streams together if you reunite them in this way. And I, I mean, that's what I mean It's like I read Capital, even volume one, and that's exactly what shook my whole worldview about it and what fundamentally changed my entire way of thinking about myself and the world and everything that we're talking about is because in him, in that writing, there were those two streams reunited and there's a certain power and a certain just like ability to, I think, you know, the same way that Marx did, like fundamentally alter and like give you a way out, a way to see things that you normally wouldn't. And so for me, that's like part of what it is to go back to the beginning and rethink everything is like, well, we go back to the beginning and then the methodology is reunite the streams. To me, that feels absolutely essential. Well, that does it for part one of our new Lost Horizons collaborative reading series on Eugene McCarrahare's The Enchantments of Mammon, How Capitalism Became the Religion of Modernity. This was a long one, so we're just going to go ahead and get right out of here this week, but we hope to see you back for part two coming your way very, very soon. And that one will be led by most likely Comrade Commissar Don and potentially me as well, Comrade Adam depending on how much time we have to get through this massive, massive tome. It's dense. There's a lot going on on every page, as we like to say. So until part two comes your way, meditate on these things, meditate on the history, reflect on the analysis, try to integrate some of that romantic, gothic, Marxist perspective into your own worldview. And for all you patrons out there, we hope to see you around on the Discord, on the movie nights and all that other good stuff. But in the meantime, Remember, stay hydrated, stay motivated, stay liberated, keep searching for those lost futures. In the past, rethink everything you think you know about what has happened, because more than likely, there's something being left out. You know, just be a good historical materialist, and also maybe even a little bit of a dialectical materialist, or you know, whatever those words mean now. I'm not even really sure anymore. I just know that I like history, as all of us do, here on the Lost Horizons Network. We'll catch you back here next time. Take care of yourselves out there, comrades. Keep those masks on for all sorts of reasons, safety and anonymity. You know, good infosec, good opsec. We're big supporters of strong infosec and opsec practices here on the Lost Horizons Network. And until we see you back here, just remember, we out here. Your comrades all across the Lost Horizons Network, we out here. Red Library out. Peace. <laughs>